um, Grosvenor, the publishers, John Wiley and Sons, asked me to write a book on World One, which introduced me to the world of developers, finances, politics, local politicians, planners, retail strategists, and the like. Hence my title, in spite of or because of, in the, the, the book is now written, not yet out, but over the last seven or eight months I've met so many people who aren't architects, and it strikes me that uh, Liverpool One has been driven by people who, uh, <coughs> but there's been so many forces coming together to form, forge Liverpool One. I don't been quite sure if Liverpool One has emerged um, because of, or in spite of, all the various, often contradictory efforts of all the associated parties. I'm not here as an apologist or a champion for Grosvenor. I sort of come bearing facts, really. Um, one, my, one personal opinion, though, that I'd like to, to air is that Liverpool One is merely a brand. It's not a place not a district, it's a brand for a new district, and I guess that eventually the brand of Liverpool One will eventually disappear. Because the deepest irony uh, behind this new district or this extended main retail area is that it's all about connectivity, linking up the streets, linking up the views, a seamless extension of what Liverpool already had. And so to brand it separately seems to me to be an oddity. And Liverpool One uh, was invented for retailers, pretty much, for retailers who were a little cynical about Liverpool. Could business really be done in Liverpool? They wanted to be sure that they could go somewhere that was sort of separate, managed, slightly different. Hence Liverpool One as a brand was born. A couple of years ago, replacing the name of the Paradise Street Development. Now this is what Liverpool, the central Liverpool, looked like around about 1999, year 2000. And you see the consequences of World War II bombing, really, and being ploughed, flat, 1960s development. You have the, the uh, Moat House Hotel towards the end of Shabazz Park, Shabazz Park being a green area. And uh, you know, next to that is a multi-storey car park and bus station, architecture of little distinction, really. And the council had long planned to do something more. And the, the, the broad political and planning strategy, retail strategy, that emerged slowly from the 90s was that you had to reinvent the heart of Liverpool, give it more shops, bring people that had been scared off or pushed out back. That was the driving force, really. Now, not long after that, oh, sorry, this is another view of the Moat House. No longer with us. A couple of years later, it looked a bit like this. You can see the John Lewis building here in the foreground. Um, the lift core, the Glen, Glen House Tower, even further back. And broadly, <coughs> Liverpool won Paradise Street Development Area, a fenced off 42 acre district, looked very much like that. And now it looks very much like this. Um, another Paul McMullen photo, actually, we took most of the photos of, of this area for the AR last, last January. Here you can see Paradise Street, veering off to, to the left, um, Manistee Lane to the right. You have Alan Morrison's building here, which Tim's going to tell us about in a moment. Glen House building, beyond that you have Howard Tompkins. To just about on the right, you can see Stevenson, the work of Stevenson Bell, and in the distance, you can see the work of Dixon James. It's a sort of an architectural uh, wish list in many ways. Not all necessarily uh, world class, international stage, landmark, iconic architects, but uh, I think the policy deliberately was good, solid well-mannered, experienced people. But this idea of because of or in spite of, it's an interesting um, one for me. <coughs> it also gets a park, by the way. This is AstroTurf in the foreground, that's why it looks so good. But it's the only bit of the park which is AstroTurf. Very beautiful park. 
can see the Pelly building in the background. Gets its own bling as well. Here's Goff's bling building. Very beautiful photo, beautiful building. This idea of because of or in spite of. Now, the, the, the various parties involved in this group one, you have, on the one hand, you've got bankers, equity holders, you have the town council, the city council, you have the fact that it won the title of European Capital of Culture in 2003, which just drove the timetable backwards, you know, quickened it up, cost Grosvenor a lot of money. Um, Many of the areas uh, flanking Liverpool One were about to be deemed and have been now deemed a, as a World Heritage Site. Precious archaeology beneath the ground. Lot, as I say, lots of competing forces. And I have to say, it's any wonder anything got built at all, no matter whether, whether you like it or you, or you don't, whether you think the master plan is very strong, personally I do, or the, or the building's very strong or very weak. It doesn't really, it, it, in, in one sense it doesn't matter, the, the, one of the interesting things, of course it matters, but one of the interesting things is that it all happened so fast. I think there are other cities around the UK, particularly in, in England, that have been working on their own in the city development for a very long time and have been watching this happen. And it's quite amazing that it has actually happened so quickly. Glimpses through to the library building, it gets its alien cinema, it gets a cult shop. About shops. This is a retail led development program. 170 <coughs> odd shops and bars. And that is one of the key things to the master plan how to get the retailers in, how to get the shoppers in. It, this, this has been driven by Grosvenor, but do not make the mistake that the, the Grosvenor of today is the Grosvenor of 350 years ago when it built Mayfair and Belgravia. The Mayfair and Belgravia, that then it was a greenfield site, it was the vision of one particular family with lots of money. This wasn't all paid for by Grosvenor. Grosvenor owns 20% owns of it. And they lost hundreds of millions of pounds on it. They got a lease for 250 years. They might get their money back. And this is a CAD image of what it looks like from, from the air. It's that big, it's 42 acres, it's 35-ish buildings, 26 architects, 5,000 people work there. And this is a map, that uh, a drawing that superimposes one map upon another. In the white, you can see the original shoreline of Liverpool. And you can see the creek uh, in which the original wet dock was built in 1715. And the light blue, see the new buildings, the way the docks and buildings pushed their way into the Mersey. And in the orange, you can see the boundary of the Liverpool One development. So it, it the Liverpool City Council, advised by the property consultant, uh, developed this, this or identified this area. They thought, if we need more shops, we need about a million square foot of space if you want to get people in spending money this is the area to do it in um, quite close to the Albert Dock and it's also in a, a neat way if you put it here it's a neat way of stitching together old street historic streets and bringing the, the main retail area of Church Street Lord Street putting it back creating links with the Albert Dock so you could walk across the city without walking through a, a rather dishevelled uh, and slightly unsafe hole. The surrounding this border, this triangle, what was once called the Blue Coat Triangle, these zones of influence. And developers, Grosvenor along with the, the others that were shortlisted, were asked, would you like to go beyond the border that was identified and look at the zones of influence? Grosvenor did with Liverpool City Council's encouragement, actually, wanted them to go beyond it, to take Shabazz Park mm -hmm. and do something with that, to push into the Rope Walks district, the Rope Walks district being a historic district, to the uh, lower right hand of the, of the picture. And this broadly formed the new extended boundary of development. 
this is another way of looking at development, and it's, it, it talks about something that David Dunstan mentioned, I think, this dumbbell arrangement that retailers like so much. Only here it's not a dumbbell, it's a triangle. Traditionally, re retail strategists like to have either a dumbbell uh, or a triangle. Uh, Blue Water in Kent is the best example in the UK of a triangle. In most shopping malls, this isn't a mall, but it does in many ways follow the principles of a mall. Um, this identified anchor stores, Cribs, Coolsville, Bread Cross. They're dumbbells in the sense you have an anchor store at one end, an anchor store at the other end, many smaller shops in and what retail strategists very often do is they give the anchor stores the shop. John Lewis, Debenhams, House of Fraser, Marks and Spencers, it doesn't really matter who it is. We'll give you the land, we'll give you the shop, we might even fit it out for you. We'll, we'll take very low rent off you, just please come and join us. It's the shops in between that pay the rent. It's, it's the next For a scheme as large as, uh, as this one, you need lots of them, and it's a best part of five years to fill most of it. It's about 92% of that now. I think um, there's about 165 retailers, most of them paying top whack. But here we see that it was originally going to be a three anchor store development. On the bottom, the bottom red circle, John Lewis which is there, the top red circle, Debenhams, which is there, and the one on the right hand side, something else. And something else never happened, actually. They could never quite, as far as I understand it, never quite uh, sign a deal with someone else who, who was a large occupier of space. So they cut that space in two, so you have two very big stores rather than a mega store. This sketch also shows the idea of zoning as well. Liverpool never wanted a mall and Grosvenor never wanted to build one. And what Grosvenor said was we want a, a, a development all about places and spaces and quarters, districts, which have their own identity. And this was their earliest stab, really, with BDP, the master plan, <coughs> sort of coming up with these distinct quarters. Park, South John Street, Hanover Street, Blue Coat <coughs> area, this is another posher drawing that shows much the same thing. So it's a plan of Liverpool one, as refined, a master plan by BDP, but as refined by American architect Stephen Pelly, which gives us these ellipses running through it. And the, 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 the quarters are, are marked out on dotted lines, not quite as distinctive as they were originally envisaged, um, but probably distinctive enough to give you, in, in each of the sort of successive spaces through this scheme, um, a slightly sense of scale. Views, this is a view through to the uh, three graces. Was one of the, these are one of the things that sort of programmed in, if you like. Uh, th there was very little context, um, as described earlier, but um, Grosvenor, BDP, other architects were quite keen to sort of maximise views and routes. So if it was all new to local people, there would be something see things where you expect to see them. This is Caesar Pelli's tower, one part west. Big row of English heritage, too tall, um, or too tall for this part of the strand. So if you just look at the other part of the building, they did that. That's the power of parametric design, isn't it? Rather than truncate it and chop it off, you get that. I think the building was the poorer for it, and also it's less profitable, less space in it. Um, personally, I'm not even sure that English Heritage are convinced they've done the right thing with insisting that it gets smaller. But no, they, they don't care. Liverpool 08, Capital of Culture. Now, this was interesting, this almost ruined growth. Around June 2003, Liverpool was a it won the competition, it won, won the race to host the Captain of Culture in the UK. Now, in, <coughs> around that period of time, June 2003, 
Grosvenor had no money, had no land, had not gone through the CPO for the compulsory purchase order process. It had very few detailed designs. But they either heroically or moronically promised to meet the 2008 deadline. We will have this built for 2008, they said. We can't promise for the 1st of January 2008, but we can aim for the summer. Phase one opened the 29th of May, and phase two, the 1st of October, they pulled it off. But it cost them. It cost them an awful lot of money. It cost a few people their jobs. And it's caused people at Grosvenor to be uh, a little rueful, shall we say, about how they do business in the future. I show this merely as an introduction to Tim. Tim recognize this, the zigzag stair. I was looking for a, an image that showed quality. Now, the, every property developer will tell you that it, uh, any property development to be successful is all about time, quality, and money. Now, Grover have pinned themselves down in terms of time. They had to be complete during 2008. They pinned themselves down with quality as well. They were determined to deliver something their equity partners, the people funding this, the people funding the other 80% that Grosvenor didn't own, insisted that they would have a say in quality. And in fact, the equity partners were very clever because they were protecting their own investment, and they said, we will agree a price for all this. If you go over budget, we are not paying for it. You will do that, Grosvenor. But we insist on commenting on all the time. Grover agreed. Grover had very few trump cards to play. So what everybody got was a scheme of broadly very high quality. And Grover just watched the cost spiral. And Travis Skempton was one of those people reminding <coughs> Grover, I think, of, their, of the need for quality. And what happened, really, it, it ha I have to say that Grover did buy a lot of the land the, the city council owned a third of it and gave that to Grover. Grover bought the rest and they bought the rest as the property prices were rising. So because of the fact of pro rising property prices and because they were working with contractors who were building, who'd begun building work before detailed design had been done because they had to meet this 2008 deadline. Changes kept coming in Contractors were tearing their hair out, prices were going up, and it ended up in some sort of horrible spiral, um, and lessons have been learned, and I'll come on to them in a moment. But we get happy children, so that's all right then. This is a boy enjoying himself in the fountains, uh, which mark the line of where the original uh, wet dock was, which made them put, put Liverpool on the path greatness really, it sealed off its estuary effectively and said ships come in at high tide and close the gates and you can, you'll be safe in here. Mark Preston, who is the group chief executive of Grosvenor, he said to me, um, he's very proud of Liverpool one, but he said we won't do it like this again and I doubt anybody else will either, it's unviable. <laughs> now what he means is effectively <laughs> It was a one-phase project. They did it all at once, one fell swoop. They opened bits before they opened other bits, but broadly, one massive phase. They won't do that again. They, Grosvenor, and I dare say other property developers watching, will be very careful to phase big developments like this. They'll be more commercial. The development agreement signed with the City Council was very clever. And what it said was, you, Grosvenor, are able to start building when they've got some anchor stores signed, or they've got the anchor stores signed up, the, the uh, compulsory purchase orders have been made, planning permission has been granted, you've got your land. But what it didn't say anything about was commercial viability. 
he didn't mention it. So Grove Hill committed in two, back, back when they signed this in 2002. So by the end of 2004, when they had the money, they had the land, they had the road closure orders, they had the planning commission, they had to get cracking, irrespective of whether or not it was commercially viable. And as it's turned out, it hasn't been that viable. Now, that's not to say that Liverpool's a loser. Liverpool City Council is a huge winner in the sense that it gets 5% of the ground rent, it gets business rate, pulling in a lot of people who are spending a lot of money. That's not, I'm not making an architectural judgment there, that they are, they're, not, they're monetary numbers. Liverpool doesn't even have to manage it or clean it. Grove does that. There's another argument there to be had. There's also this a consideration now within Grosvenor about what exactly quality is. Um, do you need a blanket high quality assessment across an entire development or will you, are you able to be high quality selectively, what is appropriate? So I think in the future, um, if things of this scale happen in the UK again, you'll be seeing developers uh, being rather more cautious, a bit more commercially astute. I'll finish on one, just on one observation. I'm, in spite of Rod Holmes's um, drive for quality architecture, I don't actually believe this is about the architecture. I believe it's about the master plan. And I can see buildings coming and going here. Um, there's a bus station, I'm not going to be convinced that Liverpool needs a bus station. Um, there's space by, the, by a very large car park that could be used for something. I think what Liverpool has is a master plan that can grow and adapt and evolve, irrespective of, of the architecture that is currently there. It's a framework to build on, in a sense. And uh, to my mind, my own personal view, and everything I've said is between these four walls, <laughs> my, own, my own personal view is that Grosvenor's gift to Liverpool is a framework on, what, on which it can build. Thank you. Buildings come and go. Um, <laughs> as my second introductory point, uh, which is a second question, is um, should, should ha how flexible should a master plan be? And in this case, it, it, is, a, it is a somewhat megastructural master plan. And we looked at our brief and were slightly flabbergasted by it. But has it ended up in a bad result? Well, you know, you, you tell us what you think. I, I certainly have a view, which I'll, I'll give you at the end. So um, we were lucky enough to take on Central Building um, 13B, as it, as it was, was called. There it is. Um, and you, you've heard a lot about how this a master plan of, of 26 buildings stitches the city centre to the Albert Dock. It gives it a new front to, to the Mersey. And uh, in, in terms of our own uh, piece of it, which is um, 125 metres square roughly, um, it forms a new edge to this park. And obviously the park is a huge part of its infrastructural and megastructural quality. It's got a large car park underneath it. It is also a piece of urban space and it's part of that urban link. Um, we felt that our building, the, the, the 13B plot, was drawing together a great many strands, and I, and I have a massive admiration for the master plan by BDP and Cesar Pelli um, for, for drawing together strands, for making connections. I think it, 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 it's, it aimed to do it and it's done it. Um, it. Our brief was not to create a look at me building, an iconic object-like building. It's very big and in a relatively low-lying, um, certainly not, not a tall building. So, um, in a way, it, it was always going to be an edge building an edge-making building, but we, we took it as a strong brief um, ju just to, to stitch the city together. We actually beat uh, Raphael Moneo, um, I'm sorry, uh, Raphael Vinoli was the, um, the, the second prize winner. And we, it, was, it was either him or us in the competition, and in the end um, we got it. And, and I, actually, I've never seen his scheme, um, but I know it. You know, I think it was a little bit less passive, if you like, in terms of making an edge to a street. And, and we admired this, this diagram, which is the, the, this elliptical part. I mean, it's an object-like form on the map. Um, it's an open space, um, and we admired the idea that that was, that was the look at me element, that was the focal element to which we were part of the edge-making strategy. And there it is. Um, it was an extraordinary thing to see it built so fast, and uh, admirable um, to, 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 see, to see the change, and to feel, well, to be part of uh, Grogan's energy. Um, you know, I, I really have learned a, a huge amount from working with them, um, and Rod Holmes, as we mentioned, is, is a big part of that. 
that single leadership energy. I mean, so that's another topic for another day, actually, you know, how, how to drive a project. Well, is there one person who knows everything and is at, is at every meeting? Well, Rod was. It was quite extraordinary. Um, most projects aren't like that. And, you know, it's, it's rare and, and was rather special. Um, so, constraints, but there were many constraints we were given. There, there is our blog in there. Um, one of the most um, difficult constraints was these cuts towards views. I mean, who on earth would think of uh, asking a uh, an architect to make a sort of two to three story cut through their building, right through the middle of it, simply to give a glimpse of, the you know, yes, a very important building, the, the library building. Will it produce good or bad architecture? Will it, will it defy the architect's vision to the point where he, he, he's, he's beaten? And, and there are many examples of you know, architects not being able to cope with such things and producing a bundle of compromises, I guess. Um, similarly, you know, can this corner be cut off? Is it worth being cut off? For a very important view from the park, the approach from Derby Square, is it, is it the right way around to form buildings in this way? Well, we asked that question wondering if it was fair on us at the beginning, um, but we, we took the challenge on the chin and um, I'll show you what we produced. Uh, the, the master plan inherently deals with, with a multi-level city. Um, so changing the level can be integral, such as the grass market in Edinburgh. They can also be very difficult and rather alien things. This is the, the St John's Centre in Liverpool. Um, how do you make them feel real? How do you make them feel integrated with the uh, city? Um, and, and how do you make it uh, feel like an, a, co a coherent piece of street, really, a coherent piece of the city fabric? That was Robert Holmes' challenge to us. We did look at scale. That, that's the Bank of England, so we're the same size as that. We are also the same size as many, you know, six or seven small, small grain urban blocks, if you compare us with parts of Covent Garden. And we wanted, we didn't want to be a single unbroken lump. There is a route through the building anyway. But to what extent, we asked ourselves, are we going to acknowledge that this is one building by one architect with a continuous and consistent treat, facade treatment all the way around it? Or should we begin to pretend it's three buildings or pretend it's six buildings? And that was a, a topic for discussion in terms of human scale. How big is the street and how big does a person feel within the street? Um, the layers of the master plan, um, ground, ground and subground. Uh, car park, rising up to lower parts of street edge, there's it's Paradise Street, Paradise Place, South John Street, it really it's, it's a cliff edge face to this kind of artificial mountain in here, and then rising up to the park on top. These are master plan drawings, they're the ones we were given. And you can see these shapes that we were given nominally, but it was a relatively strong set of constraints, stronger than any master plan we've ever created. We've done the King's Cross master plan and various others, and we've never constrained people quite as much as this. But um, we, 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 took it, we took it as the rules, the rules were the rules. We were, that was our brief, it was our commission. And we could see the point of bringing people up a couple of levels, up from College Lane, up to the park, and really making this multi-level city with um, inherent within its, its structure, structure and its anatomy, a sense of strata. And the rock strata of Liverpool, the sense of this, what once was a, a, a rocky promontory at the sort of prow of the pool, um, creek, as, as you saw in, in the previous plan, the sense of the rock and the hilliness, the, 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 the topography and geology of um, Liverpool and its toughness, its erodedness, as shown in this very familiar image of, of anyone who's arrived in Liverpool by train, is one that helped us um, develop an idea about how to make a really rather tricky set of constraints um, and, a, and a building which was so big that it's effectively a large urban block into a coherent uh, piece of architecture. So here we have that base strata, that ba base zone, and into that, um, or, or around that, there is an urban edge which relates to the outer streets, the city side of the, of the development. In the middle of that is cut this canyon, if you like. It's a multi-level street, it's South John Street, and it will in some way feel different, it's bound to feel different, and if you look at the master plan constraints, we're given a whole set of bridges and escalators and you know, connections, which are not inherently street-like. They're certainly not normal parts of normal streets. Well, you know, Paradise Street and Paradise Place are, are fine. We know, how that, we know how those work. This is, this is different. Um, it is also different as it rises up to its upper levels, um, uh, changing level with escalators on the line of College Lane, coming out to the park, and this great kind of plateau level with the great panoramic um, elliptical curve. That is also not normal. That is not a normal piece of city. It's a park front. It's something festive, it's something maritime or, 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 or open to the, to the wind and the weather, if you like. It's a, it's a thing of contrast. And we found this, um, as we began to come to terms with the, the difficulty of the shapes that we were being given, we've actually found it pretty inspiring as a, as a, as a way to do things in a, in a way we hadn't done before. An um, interesting comparison between the, the, the Piazza San, um, San Pietro, which is the same size as this park, um, very, very close to, to the same. The roundedness 
and the robustness and the toughness and the bashable nature of um, much of the fabric of, of Liverpool. It, of course, it's dock front. It needs to be bashable. Um, did uh, give, give us this feeling of mouldiness, of, of, of erodedness, um, of weather and, and robustness. It, clearly, we did not want to create a building that felt hollow when you, when you knocked it. And we did want to create a building that will last for hundreds of years, we hope. Um, it reflects the two sides of the city, the urban side and the, and the, and the salty side. Um, and it is also a city of red and white. As, I mean, obviously, everyone thinks of Liverpool as quite a red city, um, red, red brick, red stone. But it also has this strong element of white for the special building. And we knew that somewhere in there, there might be a formula for, for, for giving this building, well, for allowing this building to reflect the character or the essence of, of the place from which it, it, it is grown. Here's the promontory. There, there's the... Um, there's the Castle Rock, on high on a hill, and, and roughly here is Paradise Street, and our site actually is, is, is cut by the line of the creek. Um, we, we thought about our building may, may be as a sort of landmark retail building, a bit like Selfridges, but it's not uh, a department store. It's a bundle of shops, cafes, cinema entrance, <coughs> and so forth. And we, we also thought, it about, thought about it as a cluster, almost a sort of citadel, um, rising up this 13-metre rise up, up the section. And um, there we have the section Paradise Street, South John Street, and the park. Um, we also looked at the city grids, the, it, its own geometry, the geometry we were given was complex, the city grids surrounding it are complex, and the, and the whole building into the, the creek, development of different docks, actually knocking out a whole lot of urban fabric gradually um, to, 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 increase, to, to, to increase the extent of, of the docks, the custom house there. Th this, we felt, was going to produce a building of some complexity. It has a strong front to the park, but it also has been moulded. It's been moulded and deformed and made complex by a set of um, irregular influences upon it. And of course, that's, we think, probably where, where the interest comes. That's a very early conceptual model showing the strata. Is it a fruit which has been cut, cut and revealing its kind of inner, inner, inner um, uh, juiciness facing, uh, facing the park? Is it a, a, t a, temple, a temple cluster which has been cut and open, looking, looking strongly frontwards to the park? This was an early image. Um, and what this early set of work produced for us was a great sense of alarm and um, nervousness, actually, that we were creating a jumble. How on earth were we going to create something coherent? This drawing we didn't like. We did submit it at a certain point. You know, we had a lot of flack for it. Trevor might remember some of this. And, um, you know, is it a jumble? Is that a building? I don't know. I mean, we, we tried hard. But it took time to, to pull things together. And it was this trip to the North Welsh coast um, which helped, uh, Anglesey, actually, which helped me um, think about a, a process of erosion and a process of stratification which could come together in a, in a very irregular and simple and coherent way. Something calm, something natural, something robust. And you, know, you can see the strata of these, these um, slate pebbles have been eroded by wind and, and sand and weather and uh, over time. And they are strong, they are simple, and they're complex. And, and they're absolutely just doing what they need to do. They're just being told by the, by the sand and wind to, to, to change over time, and they do. And so, with the stratified nature of our grief, shops below, um, cafes and a cinema entrance in the middle, and plant on top, a lot of plant serving the, um, ventilating the, the, the basement um, car park. With that stratified grief in mind, we developed a sense of sort of rock erosion, stone erosion, stone strata, and when they had to erode to allow a view up to the, um, up to the line of the building, or erode to allow a view, to the, uh, to the Anglican Cathedral, they just obeyed the rules. They just did what they were meant to do. And out of it has come, we, we, we hope, a coherent um, a, a, and responsive design. That was the, the sort of final competition submission. And what you can see here is this kind of, uh, 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 everything I've talked about so far is the kind of stone crust, the main body of the building. But as well as that, it's more than that. It's quite a complex um, anatomy that it has. And there are two main other elements. One is a kind of crystal insert, if you like. And the other is this almost gantry-esque, uh, multi-level um, streetscape of, of South John Street. So there's the brief, the park, South John Street, multi-level shops. You've got one level, one level shop there, two level shop there, three level shops there, um, some leisure slotted in, all underneath the plateau. The plateau level, a main strata band, uh, which takes you out to the park, peels the way on the, on the elliptical curve facing the park, and then we've got very big cafes and restaurants facing the park, some of them on this inner galleria space, which you'll see in a moment, forming part of the entrance to the cinema, and then this vast amount of plant locked in above, and I ask whether this building, uh, and others too, will be all that easy to redevelop, actually. I mean, if we had done this master plan, we would have been extremely nervous about it, inflexibility. Um, and, and, you know, we have sort of certain principles, which I think would have been, meant this, this would not have been our master plan, but 
I, I admire it, I mean, being part of it. The lower level, the mid level, you can see all the walkways here on South John Street. Um, and if you look closely at the plan here, we took the move of, of not making it this break in the building, the College Lane break, not making it feel like two different buildings, but making it in some way respond to the um, co complexity of the geometries. So we've allowed the two geometries of the two um, perpendicular sides to play against each other, and this break of the facade invites one in, and it certainly does break down the scale to give a slightly more um, uh, fi fi finer grain, really, to, to what is otherwise you know, a frontage of over 100 metres there. And there you can see these are early designs, early drawings of, of the, the Galleria route coming up to the big curve. Um, how to deal with the main street frontage, this was an early drawing, how to make a, s a largely solid wall of the upper part, um, certainly um, do g give primacy to the retail frontage below and also be something of beauty in its own right. And you can see some direct um, uh, uh, influences of, of the Palazzo de, um, of, of, of the Doge's Palace in Venice, um, solid above, lightweight below, but also the kind of simple strata of a, of a very I mean, well-known but, but in a way very uh, bread and butter um, commercial building in Liverpool, um, that kind of stratified base and upper uh, format helped us to, to, to again, um, discover a, a, a proportioning, an unusual proportioning, of, of, of solid above, above open, which acknowledged the natural desires, the natural uh, requirements of, you know, what primarily is a retail frontage, it's meant to be very classy and open and welcoming. Meanwhile, it has this great sense of mass and solidity. So if we begin with the retail uh, frontages, each one is to be a jewel, each one is to be special, each one is to be uh, you know, branded by its own occupant, but at the same time have some street-like lasting sense of, of, of um, be, being part of, of, of a building bigger than the individual tenants. Uh, meanwhile, how does that fit within, you know, within, the, um, within the larger structure of the building? And it was Rod who insisted that we bring the building to the ground and insisted that this wasn't just you know, glass for retail and then you can do whatever you like above or, or, or rather you sort of do the architecture above. We need something, you know, classic, if you like, lasting, solid. And we, and we worked and we worked away at the different um, ways of dealing with this, in particular the different ways of dealing with the, the sort of uh, uh, how to find beauty in, in the upper wall. Um, was it going to be a glowing thing? Was it going to be clad in terracotta, metal, glass, titanium? Um, and, and, and pretty quickly the idea of stone and a good sort of stone which is somewhere between brown and brown and pale but not too pale. Uh, might be red. Um, th those, those became pretty quickly our decisions. So we've got stone, we've got a strongly marked strata band for cafes, and then we've got this three-story um, retail um, build-up with, with, with divided into retail base of the, the uh, 8.1 meter grid. Um, the likenesses to stratified buildings, heavy above, light below, meanwhile all of it very robust, are, are visible in, uh, in Albert Dock. Um, and the, 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 the moment of finding the right stone to use to, to clad this building with um, Rod, who is there, and um, uh, um, Robert from Langer Rock and the, the, the quarry guy um, in Germany. We, we quite quickly started talking to better the, the German quarry because they belong to Langer Rock. Um, they seemed as good as any. And we were thinking about Jura, Jura's limestone, you know, a, a fine grey, rather sort of, well, quite, quite, quite a pleasant stone, but in danger of looking a bit like concrete. And Mr. Better showed us his own quarry, Scheinsberger, um, this is southern Germany. And uh, that I, I need a, another slide, actually. That, that stone, when polished, and we saw some polished, looks like canned meat. It, it's pretty much the ugliest stone I've ever seen in my life. I mean, it's literally sort of pedigree chum um, style. And um, luckily, it looked, I just, it, it was pockmarked, a bit like travertine. And I thought of bu bush hammering, because I mean, bush hammering, it, we, we were bush hammering the Jura anyway, that, gr that gravelly texture. And once bush hammered, we came back and we saw these samples, and you can see perfectly clearly that the one on the right has a kind of richness and a brownness and a Liverpudlian quality, which we were all deeply excited by. And, and it happened to be very economic as well. So, um, so that became the decision. And, and you know, I think this is part of why we love um, the building that we've produced. And you know, others seem to, to respond well to it as well. On the side street, this is St. Um, Thomas's Lane, we, we actually cha changed material, um, partly for cost saving. To, to actually allow the concrete panel, which is the way these stone pieces are put together, to allow that concrete panel to show through. It was very important to name the parts. There are many parts of this building. It's complicated. Um, I won't go through them. You've begun to get the idea of the anatomy, rising up through the plan. This is South John Street to the south. Um, the walkways, the deep slot-shaped uh, units, um, lo loads of transfer structures being given fixes by BDP from the car park below, because we, we actually weren't the architects of the car park. We just 
took those asphyxes rising up through our building, ducts and, and um, this and so forth, and then rising up to this fluid form, this kind of um, taking the liquid quality of the, the curved eroded form and, and, and adding to it a crystal shape, a crystal zigzag, um, le leading, facing out to um, the, the elliptical form. And I suppose that was, in simple terms, the, the, the introduction of the crystal zigzag, which happened at the early stages, as you've seen, was really because we knew that curve mattered, and we didn't want it to be um, kind of cost-cut later to become a set of facets. Um, you know, if it had all been subtly curved glass, it might have been a thing of beauty in, in its pure form. But for us, um, a, a natural response, and I guess a celebration of you know, angled views of frontage from two different sides, you know, each, each, each occupant get, gets this sort of faceted entrance. All of that gave us this idea of, of uh, putting a zigzag uh, facing the curve. And I guess, you know, to some extent, perhaps we were, we were gr grumbling against the imposition of, um, of this piece of geometry from, from, you know, from something completely outside of ourselves, from Cesar Pelli, onto our architecture. And by the way, I mean, Raphael Vignoli's scheme actually squared that up. He, he had, had the ellipse visible within the plan, but he had made it into a winter garden. And that was part, again, part of struggling against what seemed like un an unfair set of constraints. There's the plan, uh, the section rising up through, through the cut, which leads us to the first sort of part of the building, which I'll show you a few images of. Um, how do you make a set of steps feel urban? Well, um, uh, Spanish steps is one way, um, Renzo Piano in Amsterdam is another. We saw this piece of the design as a vertical um, fissure through the, the horizontal strata of the building, a moment of excitement, and for a long time we assumed that there would be two straight escalators um, and uh, some stairs on either side, which was sort of escape and you know, the, the escalators weren't working. That was a competition of drawing and, and then it developed. You can see red, red sands over here at that, at that earlier point. We then discovered that that wasn't going to work with the building inspector because beyond a certain number of steps, even if you have landing, you need to change direction. And we thought whether we might uh, try and negotiate that one through. Um, but we also looked at um, allowing the stairs to rise up above the escalators, which produced this um, unusual and very exciting, very dynamic overlay of, of moving parts, if you like. And it's become one of the important journeys of, of, the, um, of the scheme is to rise up um, up uh, the, the, the line of College Lane up to this, this uh, uh, galleria, which is part of a kind of evening experience. Um, I'm showing you some of these images because it's just quite nice seeing the process. But here is the, here is the, the, the lane. It's a lane uh, coming down from the, the Ropal to the sort of university warehouse area. And there you see the light of the building. That's the, the benefit of, of all those garden constraints is shown in that photograph. Um, and um, this is, 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 is a good, it's very much a day and night thing. People tend to go down the stairs more than, more than that, but they certainly use the stairs, not just the escalators. And you know, what could be, what could be a better way to, to make a, an escape more than just an escape? We did for a terrible moment look at water cascading down this cut, and I'm so glad that, and I, I was quite pr promoting it for a certain amount myself, um, I'm so glad that Rod forbid us to do that, because I go to so many airports now where you have these cascades of water coming down um, you know, escalators, and it just, this is not an airport. He, Rod wanted the cut to feel edgy, and he didn't want it to feel institutional or smart or you know, any of that, and I think he, he was absolutely right. So um, there we have it. And of course, what we're coming up to is a, a, an important strata, a strata which is unlike the rest, the plateau, the level which brings us up at park level. It's a great sort of moment of change. No retail out there, but just food and drink and cinema. And um, there are actually two cuts. That's the secondary cut. And we're arriving in this space. What, what on earth is the nature of this space? Is it a railway station? Is it, uh, to what degree is it outdoor? Is it actually a mall? You know, have we, have we now arrived in a mini mall within a, within a larger um, sort of shopping complex, which is not a mall? And you know, I, I absolutely think that although we have the model of a shopping mall um, for the whole of Paris, Liverpool one, it isn't a mall because it's outdoors and you do get rained on. But here you don't get rained on. It's indoors, and it is basically the environment of, of a railway station. It's unheated. I mean, it's very much protection from the weather, which in Liverpool is a good thing. And and people do um, uh, spill out uh, using that. Now we saw it as an insert, uh, and we were trying to find a geometry, a, a regular geometry, a patterned geometry um, of parallelograms in the end tessellation, which would respond to the two main geometries, the, the second of which is actually pointing to the center of the ellipse. So we developed this um, tessellated route, and again, I am so full of admiration for um, uh, Grosner listening to us when we were began um, foaming at the mouth and, and weeping on the floor at the idea that this thing should, wouldn't have its curved corners or in some way should be completely rethought to save money. They, um, they listened to us. Thankfully, the, 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 this was not an area of cross-cutting, and um, the gallery has been built 
as um, as it was intended. And I think um, you know it, it, it's an unusual space. It's almost a surreal space. It's quite a, it's quite unlike an ordinary piece of city. But but so are gallerias, shopping arcade, you know, Burlington arcade, and so forth. It's one of those discovered indoor elements within an outdoor um, city. Um, I won't go into the technicalities, but it was it was a tour de force of, of kind of construction and not cost cutting. Um, the the big curve facing the facing the plateau is seen as this kind of crystal insert, and here you can just see the design emerging. It's a great esplanade. It's a space. The the, the level changes were tricky. We gradually got to terms with them, but it became a very theatrical element of the design, um, giving us this view out across the across the park. And um, as you see the design evolving, there it is. And um, you know it's very much a day and night thing, and it, it is it's a space of animation. The theatre of shopping is what um, Bill from the from Caesar Pelley's office uh, called it, and I think I think he's right. And we all obviously feared for South John Street that it would just be confusing or, or, or unclear or ugly um, as a result of its complexity. And um, we, you know, I, I think the very fact that perambulation and, and walking around shopping or even not shopping um, it is the nature of the beast in this case. I think that has actually helped. Um, Anchor, you know, what, what is certainly complexity, um, but but anchor it with a sense of, of coherence, and and I suppose it's it's a good master plan, which has actually led people not to get lost. There is a strong sense of, of knowing where you are in this scheme, and I think that's a great achievement. Um, okay, South John Street, that's the last difficult element for us to deal with, and the last piece of what I'm going to show you. How do you deal with all these bridges? Do they feel like street clutter? Um, in what sense is it part of an authentic street? Well, we, we looked at all the stuff we had to provide: bridges, uh, escalators. Uh, vertical routes and, um, and, and kind of walkways, upper walkways, which give access to shops. And we did see them as a kind of connected piece, almost an industrial gantry. We looked at the big spans we had to achieve to have as little visual barrier or, or, or um, obstruction to shop fronts um, as possible. And we did begin to think about really big, hefty, dock-like um, uh, structures, which would ab abut, abut the, 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 the stone uh, urban block and thereby provide for um, the routes and um, walkways that were needed. And interestingly, again, sort of tour de force of consultation, big time, um, led, by, led by Rod Holmes, um, where basically the decision between this scheme, which we did favour, and I slightly bleed for it actually, I think it was pretty good, um, this scheme or, well here it is, or this scheme, uh, which is much simpler and you know, became achievable, we found ways of doing the engineering in a much less expressed kind of way, basically that column has been introduced instead of um, that bigger 32 metre span. And that decision was basically made by a, a group of members of the public who were invited to a public consultation. They all came along and not quite voted, but you know, comments were made and there was a, there was sort of vibe in the room. And I think I think Rod preferred this as well. And and in a way, I know what he means. It's just calm. It's almost not there. It's it's very simple. There was clutter, and, and were our escalators, these external escalators, were they going to have uh, canopies over them? Well, they, they did for a long time. We designed canopies, quite special kind of jewel-like pieces within the street. But I am so glad that they were not, um, they, they were scrapped in the end, partly for cost reasons, partly because the es escalators can take being rained on. Uh, and, and you know, the visibility is much, much better. I think it's a, it's a great thing that that was dropped. And just to conclude, the sculptural nature of um, the dynamism of a form and a set of forms, which has been produced by a set of very tricky constraints, and to some extent by the master plan moulding the building, and held, anchored by a sense of solidity, a sense of something which will last, um, and something which really benefits from the contrasts of scale and the contrasts of material. Um, for us, that, that's what we've learned um, from this scheme. And it's certainly probably the like of which we won't be, we won't be doing again um, often because it, because it was an unusual project as well.